Cheers. Cheers. Come play. So, Simon Sensei, we are back and we have a special guest. This is two dollars. And he's all the way from New Zealand, so we're very happy that he's he's uh, got up so early. It's like it's pre-dawn there. Is it is it pre-dawn or is it is a light up? It is, it is it is dawn, but it sort of feels like the sun's come up early when I'm speaking to you and Simon. It's just warm, just warm inside. Just warm inside. Oh, this is going to be a good podcast. <laughs> also, uh, also, viewers may notice that it's tropical paradise in Europe at the moment, and in the southern hemisphere, it looks like winter. <laughs> it is indeed. This is this is this is actually my beard. I've cut it a certain way, so <laughs> so I think you're not. I think you're not to diss my beard, Simon. Diss me, but leave Sorry. my beard alone. It looks tartan. It's a Scottish beard. It is. Well, I thought since uh, you know with this is kind of a Gaelic thing. Um, yeah. my, I have Irish and Scottish ancestry, so why not tartan? That's good. Scott, Scott and me are pretty good. I've got a lot of Irish blood in me, and Scott lives in Ireland. So it's, this, this podcast is brought to you by the Celtic peoples. That's right. The, the coalition. There you go. The two. Yeah. Can you can you start off by please introducing yourself and your sure. karate experience? Cool. Um, so, kia ora everybody. My name's Tuari Dawson. Um, I live in Wanuamata. Wellington, New Zealand. Um, I practice Okinawan Go Judo, Myojin Soga uh, Jiu Jitsu, uh, con con contained within that is um, Yedo and some other bits and pieces. Uh, I also practice uh, Kobudo. Uh, I'm also very active in, in teaching our traditional indigenous martial arts here in uh, the Māori martial arts in, in New Zealand and around. New Zealand and other places. Uh, I'm an aquarium who enjoys long walks on the beach and eating green bananas. Um, and my favourite number is 108 for some particular reason. Uh, but no, seriously, <laughs> thank you for having me both. I'm, I'm a huge fan and um, it's given me a lot of status amongst my other karate um, nerd mates uh, to be able on this podcast. It's a real pleasure. I've been listening and watching the stuff that you've been putting out for a while, and I find it really inspiring. So it's kind of surreal to be on the podcast. So thank you both for having me. It's, it's our pleasure. It's our pleasure. So, um, so like, I didn't realize that you were, but, but like, as you probably know, then I don't need to tell you because you've listened to it. Simon takes control from about now onwards until, sure. until it's <laughs> a glass of champagne he slows down a little bit, and then I can jump in. So, no yeah. worries. As you may. Oh, oh well, so hello. Well, I, I, I've done a little bit of research on you, and I rather. Oh, that's a shame. Person. No, but you know, but, you know, just police record stuff. You know. Sure. Um, uh, well, no, what I was going to say is, rather than ask you about your beginnings, I just know something I really like. What you said is that martial arts are for combat, and I mm -hmm. thought that might be a good way to, because I really like what well, I like what you said, and I agree with you. I mean, I think that might be a good way to start things off it's much more sure. interesting than the why did you start martial arts type of thing so sure, um, sure, sure. yeah so I mean, can you share your thoughts about this statement and, and it's a bit of a long if you can remember it's a longer statement isn't it about well, so, so, could you say it again so could you give me the statement again please sorry yeah, no well, I'll just do the short version uh, martial uh, uh, are martial arts just for combat sure um, <clears throat> I would say that one of the things that I'm learning as I, like I'm going to be 15 each year. And one of the things that is always interesting to me is people talk about karate, you know, combat karate and application and real world application. And there seems to be a preoccupation with um, making things effective and being as, as tough as we can. And, you know, some practitioners would make you believe that if having zanchen and having that awareness is all about um, there's a ninja around every corner waiting to attack you with a sword or there's bad people out there with guns and knives and you know with evil intent um, <clears throat> I think that for me when I think that, as a younger man um, I've had a lot to do in, with uh, working in areas where it's been advantageous to have some physical training that allows you to defend yourself um, and I think that when you get into this mindset of, of it's always combat, 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 you get into this place of 
It's about dominating other people, about gaining advantage over other people. And when you're young and dumb, if you're standing on a door, if you're a policeman, or if you're in the military, or if you're in some situation that requires that, that skill set, I can understand that. But what I found is that for me, karate and martial arts in general, is it might be about how I handle a particular situation that life, life um, presents. So an example of that would be, how do I handle if, I'm, if I lose my job, which is a very big thing, obviously, since we've had COVID. COVID is an excellent example of um, the things that can go wrong and be un, un, unanticipated. I think that it's actually Scott who said, and one time he said, you know, we are martial artists, so we can't forget the artist aspect of that. So the level of creativity. So when I'm doing kata or I'm practicing or I'm teaching class, I'm starting to move away from going, will this punch a hole through a brick wall? Will I be able to defeat 50 men with this technique? I'm one, wanting to understand how my body moves and if I'm moving in an integrated fashion. If my intent, my, it, it matches up with what I'm doing physically. I'm understanding, I'm trying to understand the why of what I'm doing. So another way of looking at it is that people ask you, ask me, ask, as I'm sure they've asked uh, you and Scott, have you ever had to use your karate? And my response to that is I use it every day. I use it every day as a way of dealing with people. And I don't mean that physically, it can be a way of looking at problems, approaching this karate is given to me more than I've ever given to it. And excuse me, I think that when we focus on the combat aspect to the exclusion of all else, we actually become quite boring one-dimensional practitioners and boring one-dimensional teachers. There's so much more to it. Um, and I'm not talking about meditating on top of a mountain, balanced on one finger with uh, eating lotus leaves. I mean, that may be something, you know, the spiritual aspect of it is something people get really get into, and I understand that. Um, but I am talking about it. How is it that you apply, it, uh, apply the techniques we're teaching you, the techniques we've learned, in a wider context. And I think there's, if we, if more people did karate, there'd be less wars. If more people, if kids did karate in schools, there'd be less teenage suicide, there'd be less anxiety, depression, and kids would actually learn resilience. Young people would learn how to, to have some resilience and some respect for themselves and, some, and, have, and have integrated thinking. I think that a lot of things we do are virtual and that particularly our young people uh, growing up in a world where they can craft their experience. And so they have no uh, resilience when it comes to, uh, you know, the, the, just the, the, the foibles of life, for want of a better word, you know, um, a relationship breaks up or, you know. So I was going to interrupt for one second. This is, I, I totally agree with it. But sure. do you think at some stage you need to have that sort of, yeah, I always think, you know, brown belts should be like sort of the gangbusters. Sort of when you're a brown belt, I think maybe you should be really into sport karate and competitions and or martial arts stuff. I think it's important to have that phase of being a mm. bit like you did, of being like, you know, very much focused on combat and then move beyond it. So I, th I think mm. if you don't have that stage, your, your, your karate loses something, doesn't it? Mm. I think that, I mean, like having said that for me, because um, I'm six four a big Polynesian guy. So I was never any good at uh, their fighting. Uh, so I was always fighting full contact or, or kyokushin or competing in judo or, uh, you know, kudo and then later on MMA and things like that. I was just, I was, I, you know, I used to really bag uh, tournament fighters when I was when I was younger because I was so jealous. I was so jealous. But yeah, I agree. I think that in order to in order to kind of come to a place of, of really getting the full spectrum, I think you've got to go through a number of different stages. Um, and I think there's kind of rich rewards that await. You know, we all joke about our various injuries and our knees and our backs and hips and shoulders. But, you know, there's actually something, there's a deeper awareness to be gained when you stick with it. Um, and very few people do. I was, I was going to say, it's like, what a really interesting point is, is that it's not so much the kind of the 
the studying of those things, but it's the, the application, like you said, the application of those, those principles. So you know, I see kind of like a lot of people who are talking a good game, but, but you, you know, equally, like whether you're talking about a good game in terms of the combat aspect of it or the spiritual aspect of it, unless, unless you're actually applying those things, then it's, it's really just playing lip service, right? So like a lot of people who say, oh yeah, I'm the, I'm the toughest guy in the world. But like, if they're just standing in the dojo in the safety of the dojo and saying that, it means nothing equally. Like, you know, if, you, if you're saying things like, you know, karate is the, is the way to true enlightenment, but then going out and being a complete arse to someone, then again, it's just playing lip service too, isn't it? It's about the application of those principles in your daily life. It comes well, back I mean, to our it, line of being authentic, doesn't it? Yeah, 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 yeah. Being, you know. You know. I think I that, you know... So, go on. Sorry, sorry, Simon. No, you, you talk... You'll be the looking, so you go. Oh, oh really? Oh, okay. no, well, the other thing that, really, when you were talking then, what resonated with me was the idea of, um, of Shikai, Shikai no Kokoro, with the four weaknesses of the heart. Surprise, fear, doubt, hesitation. And that, you know, that obviously works for, for Kenjutsu and swordsmanship. But I always, I always I do a class on the four weaknesses of the heart. And it's a bit like, you know, I think it's important for life. So when you get your electricity bill, you shouldn't be surprised. You, th you shouldn't think, oh, my God, what's this electricity bill? They want like $200 off me. You know, what's this? You know, there should be no, you know, sphere, there should be no, no hesitation opening it. I'm going to look at it. Mm. Here it is. I'm not mm. scared. I'm not going to, you know, if you get a bill, open it. Deal with it. Surprise, fear, doubt, hesitation. Mm. You know, just, I think maybe that the martial arts should make, not should, I don't say saying should. I'd like to think the process of being a martial artist makes you more decisive in your life and more confident in your life. So you can walk mm. through, de like you said, like dealing with life, just basic stuff. Mm. Not being attacked by 50 ninjas, not, not winning medals, but being able to get up in the morning and go to work and pay the bills and do that in a, in a good way, in a confident, mm. positive way. I think maybe martial arts can help people do that. I think it does. I think that's a really good, uh, a good example of the benefits of martial arts. Oh, so you know what, Simon, when you say that, I so want to get over there and come to that class. That sounds like an amazing class. I love that there's, you know, a theme, a, a theme to it. I mean, and what you were saying before, Scott, is that one of the things that I note um, and relates, I think, to what we're talking about, Simon, is that mm -hmm. Scott talked about a while back, I was listening to a conversation in which he was talking about how the way in which it seems no matter what country you're in that at times the for want of a better word the cream doesn't rise to the top the ship floats um and you have people in charge of these vast organizations that are looking to martial arts to fill exactly those voids you're talking about to fill their sense of unease their sense of anxiety their sense of not being good enough and the martial arts does attract those people and they tend to rise higher because they tend to train in a certain way where their physical skill is not sort of commensurate with their mental, spiritual, or just being human beings. I mean, how many people do we know that are fighting machines but are, but are fighters and not what I would, what I would call karateka or even human beings. I mean, I've, I, there's a particular there's a particular instructor that I've experienced where people say, well, a great fighter, but just fails as a human being. And I think that's the point. The point for me now in, in terms of, you know, there's what I teach and then what I practice. What I'm hoping, what I'm practicing is how to be a human being, um, is to be more in touch with myself and why I do things and why I get um, shitty with my wife and, you know, why I am can be a grumpy old bugger at times. Um, what makes me what makes me a more effective, more present person? I think karate is really good for that. And like you said, Scott, you know, people talk a good game. You've got to get out there. At the end of the day, you've got to get on your key. You've got to go out, you've got to sweat, you've got to punch the maki water, you've got to practice your karate, get your key on. You've got to do the difficult thing. I mean, there are so many people that talk karate and there's so many people who say, <laughs> everyone's got an opinion, myself included, but I'm hoping that by getting up every morning, I'm getting a little closer and a little clearer. I hope that makes sense. I, I think what you said is 100% then that begins with walking into the dojo. Mm. I think probably, you're, probably you know this feeling and I know Scott knows this feeling of 
walking to a dojo dreading going because you know it's going to be really hard. You know, mm. a lot, I mean, a couple of times I haven't gone. I remember those days, there's about five or six days when I didn't go into the dojo when I should have done. But the mere fact of having that healthy discipline of going into the dojo, I think mm. is really good for everyone, just the, your ordinary person to have that healthy discipline. of like, Even the people who go twice a week, you walk in mm. that door and you train. I was going to well, say, let me ask. Uh, sorry, so just to kind of go back to what you were saying there too about, about kind of um, like the connection between um, you know, being good at karate and also be and maybe not being so good as a person like it was a, it was a number of years after i left japan and there was a, a guy who was um uh, on the instructors course the jks instructors course and he came from one of the top universities so he was one of the the few people um maybe arguably the only person i think who hadn't graduated from one of the or the karate university that, that the jks in, is involved with and um he was in, he was like basically the oxford cambridge ivy league of japan very, very clever, very smart guy, but loved karate. And, uh, and but he, he was taking ages to graduate. I think it was like, by the time I spoke to kind of one of my seniors about it, I said, he's maybe on the instructor's course for like over four years. And I was like, you know, like the, the, he should graduate, you know, like just try to put, I was his senpai, just try to put a good word in for him, let him graduate type thing. And, and he's like, and my, my senpai was saying, oh, he's not ready, he's not ready. And uh, I remember the conversation I said, I said, but he's a really good guy. And my senpai said to me, kankenai da yo. Kankenai means, means that there is absolutely no connection between him being a good guy and him graduating. Mm. And, and I thought, but there is. There yeah. is. Because, because mm. he was a good guy whose karate was actually far better than your average Joe Bloggs. Far better, you know, mm. he could have gone anywhere in the world. And, uh, and taught karate and his level would have been so much better but he was smart clever he he understood kata really really well um and and i thought he could have been a real good ambassador for the organization uh, but what they actually said to him was right the next all japan championships if you don't get into the finals of the committee you don't graduate mm. like so he had to kind of dis like so as a competitor mind a competitor mind is is very much selfish self-obsessed or self-absorbed and they have to be you know they, they you know they they're going to kind of literally go through anyone in order to get a medal to be, win and so you had to kind of kind of disconnect with that kind of academic kind of empathetic mind of his and, and self be self like the, his own being and become the person that they wanted him to become just so he could graduate i thought it was like such a massive wake-up call for me that that's that's the only thing that they were producing yeah and I think Tank that if you, you, you was like that. Tank 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 Tank, if you had your own, if you had front teeth, you were seen as being weak, weren't you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, you, you guys, you know, Okina and Karate, you know, like, <laughs> you know, I was saying to Scott before we got on here, just the motion of of, <laughs> of that sort of pressure. Um, uh, yeah, it, it would drive it would drive me insane. Um, I think that with that, you see, for me, there is a correlation between, there is a correlation for me between doing martial arts and being a good person. I really believe that. But, you know, doing, being a sensei, you know, if you look at all the sort of the, the social media and the movies and all these sort of things, you know, uh, you know, the, the, the term sensei, we know what the term sensei means. It doesn't mean it doesn't mean what everyone else thinks it means. It doesn't mean master or enlightened one or Yoda second only to sitting at the right hand of God or anything like that. <clears throat> it means the one that it's gone before. And I think that for me, my experience in, in karate is that, you know, like um, I came up through Kyokushinkai. I started in Kyokushinkai and Judo at the same time because it was that they were the only games in town in New Zealand. Um, Kyokushinkai and Judo were the two largest styles because you know we're only a country of now we're a country of about five million people um, so we're a very small country um, <clears throat> but what happened with that was that and I'm not begging Kyokushin but I'm for me there was this ongoing thing with the spirit of us and all these sort of things and this kind of hyper Japanese Japan you know none of the people that I trained with coming up here was actually spent time in Japan. So they were getting this really distorted view of, you know, I want to say Japanese Budo culture 
fourth, fifth, sixth hand. And so the, the sort of things that we were doing, I mean, you know, the bunny hopping around the board all with, you know, weights on our back and, um, you know, all, all those crazy, crazy things, you know, like, you know, I mean, things now that we know are terrible for you. But we did it because we got told that's what we did. And some of the, a lot of the people, like, to be honest, I don't think that I, for the first 15 years of my karate training, I don't think I liked anyone who was, who, who taught me. I was so frightened of them. You know, I was actually just intimidated by them. For me, there has to be a correlation in order for the arts to move forward. There has to be a correlation between building, not better people, because it's sometimes I think karate, and I think martial arts in general should be about revealing a person, not trying to push things into them. And I think when people get to a certain point, like yourself, Scott, and, and starting the, the HTKI, it feels like to me there was things that you wanted to express that you were kept from doing, and thus you had to find your own conduit to express that, not at, at the cost of anyone else, but because you were moved to do things, because there was, there was things that you weren't getting or no, not, not that's wrong. My feeling is, is that you had something that you wanted to share and creativity and individuality are not things which are, are widely accepted in any martial arts group. That's why for me, I'm a complete independent. Yeah. Um, just because I got sick of looking for mentors. I got sick of looking for sensei and I got sick of people who wanted to fulfill that role and everything that kind of came with that I'm looking for colleagues I'm looking for people who, who will mentor me um, <clears throat> but I'm not looking for superheroes yeah I was, I was talking to a, a friend of ours in in uh, Shikoku Mark uh, Greenwald from in Shikoku who, oh, yeah. uh, and he's a great guy a karate guy as well but uh, he was saying you know people people too much they're looking for kind of father son figure kind of you know like relationship he says but like actually you should have you know brothers brothers and sisters in arms because brothers and sisters you know you argue with them you fall out with them you come back but you're brothers and sisters and there's there's maybe mm. levels of of uh, seniority in, in that relationship mm. but it's not it's not kind of one above the other and i, I really like that analogy like he, like he just kind of kind of sit off the cuff kind of said it and he's a clever guy uh but yeah i think i think that that's what we should be looking towards because we're just too long in the tooth now with karate. Like it's not like go, like going back in the 1960s when when there was such a massive gulf between like the Japanese who had come over to, to Europe and teach in America, wherever it was, and the students. It's not the same anymore. And, and I think uh, I think the only way to kind of build a sustainable organization or community is to have it in that way. I and mean, we often talk about kind of leaders amongst equals rather than kind of hierarchical system. You know. I, I let me ask you and Simon this question: <clears throat> When did you start to own your own practice? When did you stop trying to emulate others? Two thousand seven, November two thousand seven. Wow, that's specific, man. That is so specific. Twenty second of November. Impressive. Uh, I uh, well, actually, I think Simon was there. Simon was there as well. Uh, first time I trained. Yeah. Um, I mean, like the 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 certainly the foundations have been put in the foundations of owning my own practice was was given to me by the instructors course and japan and and and, the, and i owe them a great debt in the sense that they they really gave me the equipment to kind of own my own practice but um but certainly the after the i graduated in 2002 and then then as time went over those five years it just got increasingly uh, more um kind of or less and less returns from the same practice i think uh, i was trying to you know continually polish and, and hone kind of a set of principles that I'd kind of really embody or tried to embody or like certainly made it my own without any sort of progress forward and then I met Steve Ubel and just saw a different way completely different way and um and it wasn't as if I went okay I'm going to follow him now uh like it was just a different way and, and a and a uh a realization that there's there was so much more and then I just started looking but Simon well, I mean, I was kind of, you know, I was just a guy who trained a lot, you know, and I mean, I suppose I was doing my own karate in the 90s. I started in 74 and I've always kind of, I don't know, I've always done my own karate because I've always done my own training. So I've trained in dojos, but I've always run, I've always trained. I like training. 
So when I was in like in London, I was I used to do squad training, but not be in the squad because I wasn't interested because I just wanted to train. So I trained every day. But then really when I met Scott, I think probably when I began to really think about it seriously was when we were, you know, when I left the JKS. So in 2015, I'd say. So 2015, I think I had to step up. And I'm continuing to step up now, which is very hard. But yeah, and I feel as though through him, it's his fault in a great way. I've really had to sort of, you know, become, discover my own karate and, and believe in it. Because when I first started teaching, because there was no one else, there was only me. You know, and that, you know, I had to suddenly find myself teaching on the international stage. So probably the big one was I taught in America. I, I did the first HDKI tour of America. I taught, I taught 11 classes in 14 days to anybody. And, and that someone got, you know, there's a seventh man over there. And it was incredibly hard. But actually, I actually thought, you know what? I, I'm teaching my karate unapologetically and for, for what it is, not compared to anyone else all its flaws, but it's my karate. So I suppose I still feel very insecure sometimes. I mean, I'm teaching with Scott in Sheffield soon in England. And a part of me thinks, oh, you know, they don't want to train with me. They want to train with him. So hmm. it's taken a long time for me. And it was never planned and it happened. But I'm glad it did. Because like you say, taking ownership of karate is really important. With the, with the, with the, with the caveat that you, you, it, you, know, you, you have to be authentic because we've talked about this before, because I'm sure there's someone in, in, well, in Wellington who runs his own style Taekwondo Kung Fu Aikido club is all mm. made up, who thinks they're the bee's knees and they're not. So I suppose, mm. uh, that's what we are, well, I think what's, what Scott says, and I believe it, it's peer recognition. So basically mm. in, in HDKI, you, you people are given opportunities and if you step up, you thrive. And if you don't want to, no problem. But you mm. have to have you have to obviously have something authentic. Does that is that is that, is that interesting? No, no, that's brilliant. I mean, you know, talking about yeah. authenticity, I think it's I think it's wonderful that you and Scott offered me my eleventh time for doing uh, for for getting on the chat this morning. So thank you, <laughs> thank you for that authenticity. Else is on its way. <laughs> um, am I getting my um, side and a tiger on the other? We need a bit more gold. postage, though. We need another thousand <laughs> postage. So, um, no, you joke. You joke about that. <laughs> so, so, tell me, tell me about. I, I have a. Tell me about the uh, the Maori martial arts and and what are they all about? And also, I'd, I'd like tell me also where do they end and your Japanese martial arts start? Um, gosh, that's a good question. So, I mean, I'll start. Probably, I'll start back to front. For me, one of the things, one of the pet peeves that I really dislike, I, I, for me, when I'm doing karate, I don't speak Japanese as I know that you do. But what I try to do is at least have correct pronunciation and try to have an understanding and appreciation for etiquette, because I think etiquette is really important. So it can teach us a lot. Um, one of the things that I dislike is when people get on these, you know, these forums, and I, I've consciously taken myself all these forums where people are talking about, well, you know, Shinpan Shiroma was taught by whoever the sensei and the, you know, and his sensei in China was, but then there's some debate about who his teacher was in China, and then they went to Timbuktu, and they started <laughs> a stall, and they had these, you know, like, for me, I just, to be honest, I'm, I'd much rather devote some time, like, if I'm talking to you and Simon, I want to talk about, hey, look, I've got this problem with my giddy, or I'm practicing particular cut and I'm just not getting it, or um, I'm teaching kids and I'm not sure how to, how to do a really good job of it. The whole thing about getting into someone else's culture and history, it just sort of smacks of, I don't want to say appropriation. I just sort of think people are genuinely interested, but I mean, how much energy do we waste just getting into, I, I, I it's not that I don't care and I don't respect the, the lineage and so on and so forth, but I'm like, I've just got better things to do with my time to discuss something which actually doesn't relate to me. And I think people spend a lot of time um, talking about the, you know, all these kind of historical things. So I, and I think history is really important to understand the history, but not to live in the past um, and also create these kind of weird sort of tributaries of going, well, we're the only, we're the, we're the true possessors of Shotokan because we were students of Kanazawa Sensei or Shirai or whoever. 
you know, we're the only, we've got the true traditional. And it's, it gets into this, and the problem about telling everyone that you're the best all the time is you have to continually prove it to yourself. And, you know, <laughs> if, you, if you had that mate who's gone to a pub or something like that, they're the ones that are going to start, they're the ones that are going to get drunk and walk up to the biggest guy in the bar and then expect you to save their life. <laughs> you know, so I'm, I, I, I find that stuff really distasteful in terms of the Māori martial arts. Um, so here's an example. There's, there's, I find a lot of parallels with Japanese, with the, the martial culture. We talk about kohai, the kohai senpai relationship in, in, in the Māori world. We have a concept called tuakana and pina. So tuakana being the older brother and pina being the younger, the younger brother. We also have a um, tuangenge and, tu, uh, and tuahine. So tuangenge and tuahine is the older sister, younger sister. And the idea of that relationship is that it's one of nurturing and respect, not one of um, run over there and bang your head on the floor 50 times to prove your loyalty to me just because I'm the... I'm the senpai. Um, so in that sense, the principle is the same, but maybe the way in which it's executed is quite different. Um, for me, when I practice, um, and I do mean practice, <laughs> um, our traditional arts, it's a way of imparting our language, um, our culture and our stories. So for instance, um, we always named every weapon we had always had its own individual name. And I'm not speaking as a, an expert on all things Māori. I'm just, I'm, I'm an expert on my own experience. So the idea, like, I guess, like, um, we were talking about Kenjutsu and Yedo and all those sort of things. And, and the idea that the soul of the samurai and the sword has its own, you know, that's very analogous to what happen, happens in the Māori culture. But it's a tangible way of keeping our culture, our language, and in particular, the idea of what a warrior actually is. So within Māori culture, a warrior a warrior was, wasn't someone who went out and hit people on the head and dominated others. It was the kind of person who was, one, took care of their family, two, respected their, respected their people, respected their partner, respected their wife and their children, was a nurturer, was a market gardener, was a hunter, a fisher, a gatherer. And the whole notion of a warrior is, you know, this kind of, I mean, <laughs> this whole idea that a warrior is someone who strides around the place banging other people on the head with a sword was kind of foreign. Um, my, my, my grandfather said to me, a man should be judged not on the size of their fists, but the food they put on the table. And that really reson always resonated with me. And I think that um, there are certain things which I recognize are very similar and um, certain principles which are very similar to what I do. But I guess one is about preserving my culture, my language, our stories, because um, we're an oral culture. Uh, the other, when it comes to karate, I think on a, from a certain level, I'm always, I'm only ever going to be an honored guest in that world. I think when I, the problem is, is that when, uh, when I start taking ownership and becoming, you know, like I said about those groups, I become the expert. Um, I kind of lose something because while I appreciate karate and I love karate, I'm not Okinawan or Japanese that I know of. Um, and I think that it's not so much a cutoff, but it allows me a certain level of a different kind of appreciation because I'm looking at it from a cultural lens, I guess an indigenous lens. Um, and I enjoy, I love karate for that. Um, the martial arts, the traditional martial arts here are used, particularly in working with people who have issues with men who have issues with violence, um, people who are in prison, it's used with young people to instill a sense of ownership and integrity and we're talking about authenticity and, and pride and who we are and where we come you know we joked before about um you know being gaelic and and having a this culture but you know for me like my last name is dawson that's not a particularly maori sounding name so i have a lineage that extends to ireland i have a lineage that extends to 
Scotland. And I'm also really proud of that. And I'm hoping one day to come over and look at that as well. Um, so I know that's a long way of long way around, but I think that karate for me is not about owning a particular style or approach. It's about owning what I practice and how I practice, what my values are and how I apply that in everyday life. And yeah, that's all I'm trying to do. So um, like just to, to follow up, especially with the language. So like, well, two things I want to kind of uh, comment on that. Like firstly, the, the whole language and you were talking about Maori having the, the senior brother and the junior brother, senior sister, juniors, as, as does Japanese, yeah? Japanese distinguish. Like English doesn't. However, like like old Shakespeare, like not Shakespearean language, but certainly old English at the time when Shakespeare was about, you would have very much have thee and thou. So how is the doing? How is thou doing? And in fact, that still exists in uh, in South Yorkshire and parts of North Yorkshire and West Yorkshire. It's a, it, yeah. How is the doing, lad? I I grew up in in North Yorkshire, and um, and how is the doing? How is thou doing? Is is very commonplace between uh, like in the local dialect, and the is someone who is junior to you, and thou is someone who's senior to you. Uh, wow. And so that 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 senpai kohai senior junior is completely and utterly ingrained within within uh, kind of certainly that kind of language but also I, I would argue british culture generally and um and what i would say is like i had to when i was in when i was doing the instructor's course i i had to do a, a number of reports and one of the questions was what is the difference between japanese martial art and other fighting styles around the world and like I did a lot of research. Well, I mean, like, I guess, you know, everyone, everyone did lots of researches when they did the, the karate paper uh, for, but, um, and so I went through kind of, I, obviously every major kind of culture has its own fighting styles. And, and so I kind of wrote quite a long paper and, you know, gave examples and, you know, uh, Sabat in, 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 um, in France and like, uh, yeah, there's a whole load of them. And, and, uh, and why my argument was that, a lot of the, those fighting styles in Europe uh, became sport much earlier than what they did in Japan, simply because we lost the feudal system far earlier than Japan. So the, Japan was a feudal system until like almost the 10th, 10th of the 19th century. So, so like it, it, that, those martial combat studies continued for a lot longer, whereas they became sports boxing wrestling you know that kind of stuff um earlier on in europe and uh and a sai sensei who read the report threw it out dismissed it nonsense that's the budo japanese budo is is kind of like you know the the only place in the world and uh and, and i of course i just went oh, oh sensei okay <laughs> okay yeah, but i just want to pass the course you know <laughs> like, don't, don't shoot the message <laughs> um well my my i'm still my argument to this day is that is that it was all the same and yes you can say that like the uh, the japanese martial art kind of became far more um kind of studied and, and refined but the 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 feeling behind it uh that, that kind of caused that can be seen in any other culture around the world so so they talk about samurai and budo or bushido but we can talk about knights and chivalry and they are identical and so I, I, I of course I'm a little bit kind of uh, I have my kind of emotional baggage and like you know I, I was I was in a bar once when I was like in the, through like halfway through the instructor's course and I know, I've talked about this before and some rather overweight uh, office lady kind of said oh what are you doing in Japan and I, and, uh, and I said oh, I'm studying karate and she said oh you foreigners you will never understand budo <laughs> like I've sacrificed mm. Here, I understand exactly what I'm doing, and so I, I like I, I would re I revolt against that kind of notion that that as foreigners we can't take ownership of karate because Japanese shouldn't really take ownership of karate then because it should be Okinawan and Okinawan shouldn't really take ownership of karate because it should be Shorinji Kempo from or Shaolin uh, Kempo from from China and Chinese shouldn't really take ownership because it should be in you know you. How far are you going to go back before you have to kind of say, oh, no, sorry, that's cultural appropriation. 
I mean, could, could, I, could I just? Yeah. Uh, I want. I want to say what, what I got from you from your from what you said was that fantastic point that to be a tough guy, you don't need to be a bastard. You don't need to be. You don't need to be like spend your whole life. I'm fight. I'm tough. I'm tough. Like you say, the the the, the guy, the real people who are tough are resilient. You fight life's the bashing in life, and then feed your kids and be a be a good person. They're the real tough people, but they're they're never mm. heroes, are they? You know, and mm. they know that's why the day to day people who go to your dojo twice a week, and you know when they walk through the door of the dojo, you don't know what their day's been like. They've been at work, they've got some worries. And you take your shoes off, you leave your worries in your shoe, and you go in the dojo. And I think it's mm. really important that we have that image of being tough is not, you know, being able to fight a million people, you know, or being. I think being that... So I'm gonna, I, <clears throat> pardon me. I think that um, no, totally, and I love that. I'm going to be using it. Leave your worries in your shoes. I'm like, I love that, by the way. It's a wonderful. You know, it's a Buddhist thing. It's a I mean, you know, I've, yeah, Buddhist, love it. When, when you go, when you meditate, you leave your worries. In your shoes. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's you know, to, I mean, I wouldn't um, claim to be um, have any huge knowledge of Buddhism, but my experience of it. One of the things that I really like is that, you know, and I'm paraphrasing is that you know, Buddha said that if you, you should meet me along the road, yeah. you know, kill me. You know, so yeah. <clears throat> the idea of killing yeah, yeah. expectation um, and killing illusion, I think that we have a lot of illusions about ourselves. And I think, you know, Scott, you were talking about the way in which, you know, Asai Sensei, you know, Asai Sensei is interesting and in that, you know, I've n I never met the man I never trained with him, so just purely an observation. This is a man who incorporated Chinese animal styles uh, and a fluidity that, which is is very, I guess, uh, individual. He had a very individual approach to Shotokan, from what I can see. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> and I think it, it, you burden yourself when you sort of say. When you when you discount other people, there's nothing worse than dismissing, being dismissive of other people's culture, other people's approach. And I think that for me, the karate that I do, I mean, I don't know if Miyagi Sensei, if children of Miyagi Sensei would come back and see me practicing in my dojo and go and recognize what I'm doing. But if I continually do it with the expectation of living up to some weird illusion. Uh, where I am trying to emulate someone who's been dead for almost a hundred years, um, or you know, continually looking back. You know, it's really important to be here and to look forward. So um, there's a really wonderful instructor in in um, in America called Sal Balahi Sensei, a Shotokan teacher. Now he does this thing called mace karate, and and it's working with steel mace. Um, he's a wonderful instructor, and what he did is he just got to a point where he's going, I'm just going to see if I can, how how I move. Um, and he's just steel mace. He's just skipping ropes. He does all sorts of things, and he's got beautiful kobudo and beautiful karate. And I think that he's an example of someone who's in full ownership of what they're doing. Um, you know, with the HDKI one of the things that I'm sort of learning and sort of seeing completely from afar is that it's a place where people seem to be able to come. And it's that saying of a good teacher will tell you, um, will show you where to look, but not tell you what to see. And I think that's what lacks in martial arts. Um, a, lo a lot of bad teachers will tell you what to see, where to look, and when you can, and to keep your eyes, tell you when to open and close your eyes. And I think the idea that, you know, there are absolutes in martial arts are the things which hold us back because it's all about how do we keep our little center of power? We've all had that middle manager. We've all worked in, in some situation, you know, low level <laughs> factory job where you've got that one foreman who is so defined by what he does, his little bit of power to tell you when to go, go on break or when to come back from lunch, you know, he takes it so very, very seriously. And I think it's the same in martial arts. You have these people who have created, who are living in these illusions and, and actively feeding these illusions about their own superiority that they've started to believe in them. And they tend to surround themselves with people who will update that. They, they, they attract a certain character type. I don't 
but for me i don't have the energy the time to create acolytes i want like you said um like you both said i want to create brothers and sisters and family and people that will challenge me people that will support me but also people who will kick me in the in the backside when i when i need it um that's the that's where the richness of this is and the problem is is when we spend all our time jumping through these invisible hoops and i don't want to be anyone else i mean i look at what you do scott and i go jesus how does he kick that high with no warm-up <laughs> You know? and I'm like um, I watch some of the stuff that you guys do and I'm you know I watch Ross and Rue and I'm going I'm never coming to Dublin um, and training <laughs> with you because I'd be absolutely terrified to get into one of those classes but the thing is is comparison is the is the is a thief of joy and the comparison is a thief of fun as well too you know we all have something to add we all have an experience which is valuable and uh, you know we need to do things which which scare us I mean you know, Simon, you're talking about, you know, the fear of going into a dojo as a sensei, you know, the lofty, lofty God almighty sensei has answers to all things and can move things with, purely with the power of my mind. Um, the fear that I have going into a dojo is different. And that is, it's like, is anyone going to turn up? You know, is anyone going to, you know, standing there, you stood in, the, in a cold dojo or wooden floor, it's the middle of winter, you're in your gi and no one bothers to turn up. That's sort of you know, getting past that stuff is really hard too. That's the crazy no one talks about. I mean, and, that, and that's the really, I see that it's really important. I, I opened my, my, my other dojo open yesterday and I had no idea who had come. And I don't know, 19 people came and it was wonderful. But you have that doubt. And Scott's got a great story when he started in Ireland. I mean, he started from nothing in Ireland. Now, in the old day, pre, you know, pre giving out leaflets and stuff. And, well, you know, you can tell that story. But that's, you know, they're the crazy stories that are interesting. They're, they're the tough guys. You know, mm. it's like mm. build, build, building a community from nothing is really yeah. hard. Yeah. Yeah. And I think it, it also comes down to, um, I think it also comes down, there's got to be a belief that you have something with teaching. And Scott and I were talking offline this morning about it. Now, the idea of, I mean, the HDCO is doing something which I dream of doing. I dream of doing, but I've always been too frightened to try because there's this, always this imposter syndrome, uh, syndrome going on. I started training in 1977 and I've learned a thing or two in that time, but I've spent a lot of time training with some real clowns. I've learned from a lot of people what I don't want to do, who I don't want to be and what I don't want to teach. But the idea of putting of backing yourself 100 is is i'd rather face a face a, a room full of gangsters than actually well, back myself so like, that intrigues me that intrigues me yeah it was just, you know today scott rang me today and said don't forget we're doing a course at sheffield and you're teaching with me and i go no i know you know it's true it's like oh no, really mm. well, I, also, mm. I also said simon you're a bloody idiot well i am but yeah because well, you know yeah. i love you now, I know, I know, but I mean, I think that stepping up to the mark is really important in martial arts because it's really hard, you know, mm. and, you know, I think, you know, I think the whole point of training is to push it, like, you know, Bruno Koshi says he crashes like boiling water, don't take it off the heat, but it's like, we are doing that, you know, we are, we are, we are pushing ourselves. Yeah, it's mm. a question for Scott Sensei, HTK is an all-styles organisation, discuss. Not for me. <laughs> we are we are a community. We have a community. Actually, we have uh, we have one Goju Ru uh, member, don't we? Yeah, wow. we do. Fit that. Yeah, fit that. Yeah. Not know oh, that. Okay, but why are we on Goju Ru then? So, my knowledge of um, New Zealand Goju is like John Jarvis. Did John Jarvis started with him? And he was yes. Chopper Shin. He did the he did the hundred man Kumite. Then he met Higawana Sensei, uh, who was amazing. And then he joined that in the eye. And then uh, did, did you start through that, through that organization? Or was it, was it Paul Starling? I, was it his No, Paul Starling was Australia. He was Gordu Kai. Um, yeah. So Kyokushin was the, only, was the only band in town um, for much of New Zealand's karate history. Um, since yeah. John Jarvis started, I bought Kyokushin. He was a shibucho for Australia and New Zealand, if memory serves. Um, yeah. I was a child when all this was going on, though, of course. So... 
I'm not, I don't speak without a great deal of authority. Um, he was introduced to Hiwana Sensei by Don Drago. By That's Sensei right, yeah. Don Drago. He's got a book called Curiosity Killed the Cat. Mm. Uh, um, and, you know, there's some, and then, you know, Drago Sensei, you know, made this famous statement, which a lot of people in Gorjuri kind of, you know, dine out on to be totally honest um you know in in a real fight and you know in a real fight um if you put all the karate masters in japan and in, into a room and told them to fight the only person who would walk out i'm paraphrasing would be higuana sensei um you know what said, to his credit said the toughest guys in martial arts are sumo or are rikishi or sumatori yeah yeah but I and i think you know also also too that's not something higuana sensei said about himself um so yeah so um the thing about um, Java Sensei was he had an organization called Rimbu Den because he did Jodo, Yaido, Kendo, um, and, and he was very much into um, a range of different martial arts. Um, it, in the end, it became what is today the IGKF in New Zealand, which is a very strong organization. Um, but yeah, Java Sensei was really the kind of, uh, I would say, the kind of progenitor i don't know if that's the right word but he kind of created he was yeah. the the person that really created at least called Juru in new zealand and he was a very huge part of the early days of kyokushan in new zealand as well but how did you start in you then uh, so i was a kid i was a little kid and we changed i didn't but know the difference yeah so i was um i was in the iagk for a number of years my sensei left um <clears throat> to pursue another affiliation with the jundakan jundakan international and the uh, sensei Tiro, uh, chinan sensei who's um, um, god rest him he's passed, passed away in 2015. he was great he was fantastic yeah and um and i just i guess his approach is something that i always really enjoyed and then i lived abroad for a long period of time so i trained with a lot of different um gojuru goju kai um, a little bit of shitoru. Um, um Shotokan always seemed um, to me to be, you'd have to be a super athlete to do it because just up, pounding up and down the dojo and kicking high and all those. I mean, you know, we only have 12 kata in Gojuri, you know, like, and I have enough trouble remembering those, let alone the, the syllabus of Shotokan. Um, goju kata are really deep. And, I mean, I, I think 12 kata is perfect for Goju because each one has mm. their own flavor and their own character. Shotokan karate are repetitive. They have similar links. I think, you mm. know, like, I don't know, sci-fi, siunshin, you know, they're all mm. siunshin. They're very much their own katas, aren't they? Yeah, I, I think that, for me, one of the things I take comfort in, and I'm going to ask you and Scott a, que a question in a second. Okay. Uh, Miyagi-sensei was the kind of person who would teach person a kata based on their physicality and their mentality. The sort of things which kind of uh, set with him. And he's going, oh, yeah, no, the people are making impressions. So um, from what I understand, after Miyagi Sensei died, there was only very few people who actually learned the entire syllabus of kata. So a lot of the senior sensei then had to go to each other and to, you know, to fill the gaps in their own knowledge. And Miyagi Sensei never gave out any shoulder and never gave any dungeon. Yeah, he believed that, that should come from the, yeah. So <clears throat> here's a question for you and Scott. So you're on a desert island, a karate desert island. You can only take two kata with you, and they're the only two kata you can practice with your life. What is it? What kata are they, and why? Oh God! Go on then, Simon. You answer that one first. Well, I'll answer <laughs> that one because I'm I'm not very good at karate. So it, I, I would I would do okay. They, um, this is like obviously a desert island. This because in homage to original karate of uh, the show in variety, I do techie showdown. Yeah, and then because as homage to being a Shotokan practitioner, I would do Sochin, which is the only in the, the Shotokan version of Sochin. There's no other that, that's uniquely Shotokan. So as a smart ass answer, I do Shorin Ru, Teki, the Hanchi, and I do Sochin. And also because we're on a desert island, no one could see me and criticize me. <laughs> <It's not laughs> <sensei>. <laughs> I, I think uh, I think I'd have to do Sochin as well. Because... But you did better than me. Make sure, make sure your island's far away. <laughs> probably not on the sand, to be fair. I probably wouldn't do that well on the sand. Uh, Sochin. And I think um, I think I'd do Teki Sandan. 
only so I could show off to myself how fast I can do it. <laughs> I don't no, know. I'm going to put the question back at you. What cutting would you do then? So, well, I would do a, a secret cut, and only to us, only to a select tree. Uh, look, I'm gonna, I'm gonna say if you're gonna, if you're gonna bring that out, so I'm gonna say something um, which is probably gonna get me in trouble. I've got a sanction question for you. So uh, uh, tell us a two cutter, and then, and then you can bring up what you're gonna bring up. Probably the two cutter that I would that I would do would be hmm, would be Saison. Saison's a cutter that I that I would yeah. do. Yeah. Um, and to be honest, I only say this because um, it's a kata that I'm not particularly familiar with. I mean, I've been practicing it for over 30 years, but I'm not very good at it. And I'd like to spend some time as a suprempe or pechura, depending on who you're training with. Um, but, you know, suprempe is the, the most senior kata in Gojuru. I wouldn't want to do it for because it's the most senior kata, just because I think that <coughs> it's a kind of conglomeration of a lot of principles you find in other other the other gorgeous cut there. and I just it's just with it's just I get its style and the study on its own. I don't I wouldn't look good doing either of them, but it's the ones that I practice. Oh, it's just on, on Super Empe because I've done mm. a fair bit of Goju over the years, and I mm. love the respect it has because I I, I, mm. I I a few years ago I've trained a lot of Goju and I was training some guys who were third and fourth down, and I said you know can you, know, do, you do you want to do Super Empe? They said no, we don't know it, and you you know they mm. don't do it until the fifth down. I kind of mm. love that. Kind of, I, I love it and think it's mad at the same time. But I love the respect yeah. it has. I, I once taught. Uh, I, I once taught Super MP, the short conversion of Super. Uh, Machiho, yeah, yeah. Machiho, Super MP. Yeah. Mm. Uh, I, wow. I, I got the fear of teaching it, and I, I stopped teaching it because uh, because people didn't give it the respect. They were like, "What's this? Like, what? Like this? This is not a short kankata." And, mm. and obviously. Was it like you know Nakiyama since he talked about it as as being a cutter like the lost cutter of Shotokan? And yeah, the just... Kyo University guys do it, don't they? Kyo do yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. So, is your question about sanction then? Oh no, I, I well just be to quickly going back to Super Impact. I think that. Um, I think that Super Nimpe is, people call it the master cutter. I don't think you have to be a master to do it. I, learned, I learned, started learning Super Nimpe when I was a Nida. I, I had a sensei who believed that really giving the, you know, giving you the body of knowledge in terms of physical, the physical body of knowledge, and then spending time crafting it would take a long time. So um, I went to a Gashuku in the States with Chin and Sensei. Um, probably in about 19, I want to say 95, um, Spokane and okay? Washington. Yes. Yeah. And, and um, you know, there was a lot of people from all over the world. And, and for some reason, we got, I got put into a group that were going through Super Impact. And Chin and Sensei had this idea that we were going to spend the day because Super Impact, of course, is the, you know, the, the translation is 108. Which is a you know, apparently a sort of a, a lucky number in, in the culture. And he decided that we were going to do Super Impe 108 times. <laughs> they were very hard so, courses, weren't they? Yes, they were very hard. But um, but uh, during that period, I okay, I, I could walk through the framework of it. I've spent the last 30 years trying to just trying to understand them. I took, I think it's a really interesting kata, um, pu purely for that reason. I'm, um. You were going to ask me a question about Sanchin, I yeah, think. Yeah, well, because I, mean, I, I love go to Rue, and I've got, I've got two questions. Have we got time to go to Sanchin? Yeah, yeah, no, but just before you go on to that, though, like the like the 108, I mean, Simon probably talked talk to you more about that or be able to talk more about it. Yeah, yeah. 108 is uh, like the, the, the number of sins within Buddhism. It's like a magical mm -hmm. number, but also, like, uh, we in, in Shotokan, we have uh, go to Shiho Sho, go to Shiho Dai, which is 54 steps. So 54, mm -hmm. 54 is 108. We also have Niju Shichiho. Now, Niju, uh, not, not Niju, uh, Niju Shiho, Niju Shiho, uh, which is 24. But like, uh, like the, there is a like a theory that Niju Shiho or Nisei Shi, uh, like it could have been actually Niju Shichi, and Niju Shichi is 27. Mm. So 27, 54, 108, and like them being kind wow. of. Uh, magical numbers uh whether that's true or not i don't know but like certainly 108 and the derivative of, of or the divisions of 108 is, is really important mm. well that's that's the age that i've decided to live to so that, you know hopefully 
hopefully if I live can live that long, um, that I'll that I'll suddenly become youthful because it'll be a lucky number and um, I can start all over again. <laughs> So to, to just just a, a, a couple of questions. I, lo- I mean, I love the point about me. You know, Miyagi Chojin never taught anyone the whole system, and he taught catters that suit you, which I really like the idea mm. of that. But the one catter he taught everybody was Sanchin. And mm. you know, when, whenever I've done Goju or read about Goju, everyone says everything is in Sanchin, and I don't get that. So as a Goju practitioner, is everything in Sanchin? This is the bit where I'm supposed to say something where I'm supposed to um, be mystical and no, no, and you know, say some kind of... people ask me people ask me questions all the time, and I often go, uh, I don't know. There's no problem in saying that. I, I so mean, here, here we, so here we go, getting myself in the deep water. So I'm going to think. So I'm going to think you and uh, Scott from No, I don't think everything is in Sanchin. I no, think I that Sanchin is no, Sanchin is a hugely misunderstood kata. Um, the Sanchin Shimmy, you know, the testing has become, I mean, how, how, how much, how well can you, could you do a cut, huh? And someone was belting the shit out of you. You know what I mean? <laughs> I mean, the thing is, is that Shimmy is about testing that the, the respiration, it's about testing that there's the right muscle control. It's become this thing of let's get some four by twos out and smash each other with them and let's leave huge welts on each other's shoulders. People, for me, the problem with that sort of testing, and people say, well, I lack spirit, and perhaps what I do if that's the case, that how can I show you my understanding of the kata when I'm trying to survive it? You know, it's about respiration. It's about even Sanjin Dachi. I mean, Sanjin Dachi, you know, is a super pronounced um, Sanjin Dachi that we do in, in, in Sanjin. I think that holding that much tension in a really unhealthy way, can lead to all sorts of health problems. Um, and I think Sanchen, Sanchen is a cornerstone cut of Gojuru and a signature cut, but I think done properly, done well, and done properly and done well is not having the biggest guy in the dojo smash the hell out of you while you're doing it. And I think done properly is not loud guttural breathing. People get really, really caught up in the sound that it makes rather than the respiration. You're supposed to be breathing from your tandem. So I think Kata, uh, Sanchen as a kata is an extremely important kata, but I think you have to understand what you're trying to achieve and what the kata is actually about. It's a very external kata. And I think, but also it's a drill. I mean, when I practice Sanchen, I'm not going one, two, three, four, three, four, three back. I practice Sanchen up and down, like just the opening, you know, um, up and down. For me, it's more of a practice, a drill as opposed to a specific kata. That's my own approach. Um, but no, I don't think everything is in Sanchin. I think everything is contained within within you practice. <coughs> um, I, I think maybe just... karate has lots of easy answers. You know, people are kind of like platitudes. So everything in yeah. Sanchin, they don't, and then no one talks about it. You know, like, yeah. you know, well, I think... there is no things attacking karate. No one talks about it. And yeah, well, I, I, I think, think also too that... So, you know, yeah. Also, I, th- Sorry, I think Simon. people don't answer. People don't ask questions about that because then it makes them feel thick, or they think that people will think, "Oh, you don't get that, you don't understand that." And so the the mm. those yeah platitudes kind of force people to to not question things, which is should be the opposite of what karate should be, right? Worst thing yeah, well, is when, when that when you say that more training thing. You know, when you go, I talk to my sensei because I've done, I've, you know, actually I've done I've done, I've done the showdown for twenty seven years. I'm not sure. And you go, you need to do more training. It's yeah. like, no, you need to help me. Yeah, it's a bit like faith yeah. healers who, who, you know, who say, oh, you just have to believe more. Yeah. yeah. Look, look, having having said that, I'm glad you brought that up. If you'd, if you'd both like to um, put your hands on the screen, I will heal you of all ailments. <laughs> that is a power. I've got the money. That, 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 that I have. <laughs> um, that I, well, I, I, give, I give an example, an example of that, right? So um, for me, what, you know, in terms of, like going, like talking about the idea that when people say, "Oh, you just you haven't trained enough," I like so what Scott said when you were talking about that particular you know experience you had in Japan with that sort of rather overweight woman who'd done a little bit of karate or judo once. You pronounce how you know because you weren't Japanese, you would never gain an understanding of budo. Um, I think that we work hard enough, we sacrifice enough. Um, 
I think there's so many platitudes and there's so much BS in karate when people come up with these kind of circular, you know, these kind of circular platitudes that actually mean nothing. You know, like even, you know, the famous karate nichi denashi, you know, for me, it's not about, it's not about being able to kill someone with one punch. It's about having intent. It's about the intent you put behind the things that you do. And it's not just in terms of karate. And also, you know, that's a, a derivation of a, of a kendo um, ideal and a kenjutsu ideal. So the, the idea that you can apply common sense and have some sense of critical analysis after years and years, after decades of training, I think should be encouraged, not discouraged. And there's a lot of illusions. There's a lot of stuff that we go, you know, <laughs> you know there's a lot of um, false traditions that make absolutely no sense um that we we do because and the answer is well that's how it's always done how many times we've heard that oh we do the cut because that's how it's always done i mean in that cut the chinte the, the three step back the three they hop back you know like i mean um <laughs> you know like i've seen people like like ian abernathy come up with wonderful bunkai to that um but there's a lot of stuff we're saying we do it because that's how it's always done isn't enough anymore yeah. especially if you've been training for a long period of time it's just not enough and like you said simon short answer is hey look um yeah i don't need the the jedi the star wars platitude i just need you to show me what the hell i'm doing on this cut i think it's a reasonable it's a reasonable question excellent well we're, we're kind of almost running out of time so uh one question i really want to ask okay because I, I i watched your kakie stuff which was great mm. and uh, I love Kakie, and I think Shotokan's uh, biggest weakness, uh, well, I'm coaching Scott now, but Shotokan's greatest mm. strength is Keon, lots and lots of Keon. Shotokan's mm. biggest weakness is doing too much Keon. Is mm. that the right quote? Yeah, well, Hopefully. you can paraphrase. Yeah, no, it is. Yeah, that's... Yeah. Okay, so go, 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 I mean, go to your greatest strength, from my point of view, is Kakia, I think it's great. What would, what, what, what would you say the great strengths and weaknesses of Gojiru and thoughts on Kakia for everyone in the karate world? Okay. Um, I think Kakia is part of, uh, I think Kakia is part of working towards, um, is part of an approach to sparring. I think sparring is a really important part of our training. I think that um, there are some people who see it as, I mean, I think you get to a certain point where physically where kakia becomes as, becomes your sparring, which is, is fine if you're at a certain point. I think that the, there's something which happens in sparring. And sparring is not fighting, but sparring encourages adaptation. It encourages you to understand distancing and timing and all those things. But I think kakia is a building block of those sort of practices. For the most part in Gojuru, our... Um, our bunkai is all very close so it's, a, it's a working in a certain distance um, <clears throat> I think the weakness of, of uh, Gojiru is this is that we fall ourselves into believing that um, you know the, when you put the words traditional karate on anything I mean how old is the tradition um, I think the karate in my experience becomes something that it was never intended to be I don't think that it's as mysterious as people make it out, but I also think it's not as simple as people make it out. So it's this weird kind of a thing, irrespective of style. Um, I think that when Gorjuru people get together, irrespective of what their lineage is, and I hate that term, I hate when people get together and the first thing they do is go, what's your lineage? I mean, I had a really good, I had someone who's a really close friend of mine when we first met, he says, what's your lineage? And I said, well, watch me do kata and you tell me. You know, you tell me what, what you think my lineage is. Um, except, you know, let your karate speak for itself. Um, as I said, calling yourselves traditional anything is can be can lead to arrogance because of the, the belief that we are the one true way of doing things. And I see that a lot in Gojiro. Um, and there's always the infighting and who's, you know, who's this and who's that. I think that... Uh, the thing that I think there's a lot of whether people want to say it on there's a lot of style affiliation and personality politics that goes on in, Gorgia, in the Gorgia world there's some wonderful practitioners that no one's ever heard of 
that are out there doing it, working hard, um, get their gear on every morning, every night, teach classes. Um, those people should be, I don't want to say recognised, but not discounted. Um, and I'd also like to see people trying to emulate these unrealistic um, these unrealistic standards. Um, I'm not, if I'm out there, you know, who want a sensei, chin and sensei, <clears throat> you know, whoever, um, you know, Yamaguchi sensei, whoever, I'm not out there to try and be, do a version of Yamaguchi sensei or Hegawana sensei because it's just not possible. They they have their own integrity, their own authenticity. I'm trying to sit in mind. And I think that's something that should be encouraged. A personal journey as opposed to how, how much can I emulate um, some kind of cookie cutter stereotype? I'm going to get in trouble for saying that, but that's how I feel. No, it's true. No, also, you know, he go on a sense he's five foot four. You know, you're mm. six foot two. I'm six foot one. You know, I mean, I think mm. I spend a lot of time trying to copy people. You know, and that, mm. you know, that, that's bad. It's bad teaching. You know, you got to be your be yourself. You know? Yeah. Well, I mean, I mean, like, well, and, and just so, just for the purposes of this, like, I'm six four. So. Yeah. You know, like, so I'm even more unco at 6'4". I mean, like, I look at Gorgiru and I go, I'm too tall for the stall. I'm too big for the stall in the sense that I'm clumsy, I'm ungainly, and I watch... I mean, like, Scott, when I watch your stuff, I see what you can do, and I'm going, my God. You know, like, there's always that comparison. I'm so slow, I'm flexible, and lacking in so many things. But the, the, the challenge is not to get into... To get, caught into that comparison is just to enjoy your practice and, and do it earnestly and hopefully with authenticity. Have you noticed on your clip when you're beating the hell out of the Makawara, the Makawara turns and goes, oh, he's very slow and clumsy. I mean, you know, mm. you, you, you're, you're good yeah, at what you, you <laughs> Yeah, but, you know, you know the Makawara, I mean, there was, there was actually, there was no Makawara. That was added in later for effect, you know. Because, you know, I, P P Peter Jackson, I like Peter, Jackson no Peter Jackson, Peter Jackson is a, is a personal friend. Do you know, first thing they say, first realize <laughs> there is no Makiwara. We are the Makiwara. Very nice. Well, listen, like the last, last, last question then. Uh, so, uh, so you do uh, your own podcast, Invisible Sensei. Tell us mm. about that. How can people listen to it? Um, well, the question is, why would they? Why would they? That's the big question. That's the bigger question. Um, so I so basically sort of I started a couple of years ago, um, and it was because I had queries about my own practice, and I just wanted to get. Sometimes you we think things, and they kind of ruminate, and they you know. So, and I have you know I have always had um, issues. I've always you know depression and, and, and anxiety have always have been a large part of my life. Um, not my life, but I've had you know certainly. I know those those two. Um, what were we were calling them before, Simon? Those two, uh, no, not sins. They're not sins, but but condition, you know. Black and dog. so I wanted to, yeah, black dogs, black dogs. Yes, thank you, Winston Churchill. That's what he he coined that phrase yeah, apparently. Yeah. Um, so really, what it was about was getting an out, inside conversation out, you know, the, 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 trying to share thoughts and what's been really incredible is that people have kind of gotten on to it and started listening to it. I think, I think, I don't know how many people listen to it, but it's, um, you, you can find it on Spotify. It's just the Invisible Sensei. Um, I, I saw it and, today. A big pattern? I, 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 I had a look at it today. I think really what's, what's important is, I think me and Scott have suffered from this a little bit. Everyone thinks we're okay. Because like, we mm. see you and you think he's a big tough guy. He's really good at karate. Oh, he's also a big tough guy. He's okay. Oh, look at yeah. Simon and Scott. <laughs> They're doing really well. They're okay. I mean, we had a mm. conversation initially. You know, we're like really tired of dealing with stuff. You know, it's hard, really hard. And, you know, mm. I mean, I, I'm very, very up and down. Emotional. And mm. it's really good that like, you, know, you can actually say that. Because, yeah. you know, karate mm. brutal guys aren't meant to say that, are they? Mm. Mm. Uh, well, you know, I mean... Budo, schmudo, you know. <laughs> I mean, the thing is, is that there's, 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 you know, like yeah. to be honest, yeah. to be totally honest, there's, there's strength and authenticity, but there's also strength and vulnerability. Um, it's all right to yeah. say we don't know things. It's all right to go, you know, like in class, if a student asks a question and we don't know it, we don't go, you need to train more, you know. <laughs> it's like, just say, just say, I don't know. It's okay. That, um, that, that is, and that's that kind is of a what, brilliant point. That's a totally brilliant point. 
you know. And I think a lot, of the, a lot of the early Japanese senseis didn't know, and they just said mm. that, that, that that's a cliche training. Mm. Yeah. Because I remember to and, my, you know, Manchikamai, we have this group, Manchikamai, mm. and Shoshu Kan, you know, which is mm. mis, much misunderstood, and people would mm. make terrible bunkai for it. And it would have been mm. really refreshing until they don't know. Or well, the end of Chinte, where Scott knows the stories of that. You know, people mm. just accepted you were jumping over a chain or some sort of slippy river. But yeah. being attacked <laughs> right. by snakes. You know what I mean? And we had it all. And, mm. and then, you know, and in the end, no one, no one had the balls to go, oh, I don't know. Yeah. Mm. Or, or the yeah. balls to say they hopped back to, so they could finish at the same yeah. spot. Yeah. Um, so, look, in, in essence, I know we're running out of time. So, yeah, the Invisible Sensei is, you can find it on Spotify. If you, uh, We're on Facebook and Instagram as well. But um, the Invisible Sensei, basically, in essence, the reason I call it that it's not because I'm particularly invisible. If you if you see me walking down the street, you go, that guy's not invisible. Uh, although I wish I was more invisible, if I'm being honest. But it's winter time, so we eat. Um, uh, it's about the Invisible Sensei that exists in us. It's about the invisible sensei that says to you at seven o'clock on a cold winter's night when the sun is down and, and the fire's beckoning, there's something good on telly and you, you're sitting, you're wondering if you'd, you should have dinner and just kind of not go to the dojo tonight. It's that the invisible sensei is the guy who says, hey, grab your gear, get in the car, go to the dojo, get your gear on and see what happens. Um, that's the invisible sensei. The invisible sensei that says to you, if you're training, and the person you're training with treats you with disrespect or puts you in risky situations or is just not a good person. It's trusting that intuition and trusting your gut and not going with it. And also, the Invisible Sensei is the one who said, am I not doing this because I'm frightened of hard work? Or, you know, it's about getting honest and we all have that, you know. Um, and that, that's really what it's about, but yeah. Sorry, Scott, that was a long way. And that was a big blather. I think on that lovely note, we shall uh, we shall do our final kampai. Yeah, so, cheers, my friend. Really pleasure yeah. to meet you. Kampai. Thank you. Hopefully, I hope we can get to New Zealand soon. Oh.